So let's define those different stages. A nebula is a cloud of gas and dust which contracts due to gravity. A protostar is where friction between the particles causes high enough temperature and pressure for nuclear fusion to start. A main sequence star is a stable period of a star's life, during which the force due to that radiation pressure outwards and the gravity force inwards are balanced. At the end of that main sequence, then the star expands and cools and becomes what we call a red giant star. Elements up to iron are made, so elements as heavy as iron are made during that process of expansion and cooling. Then eventually the outer layers of that red dwarf drift out into space and the very last bits of fusion occur and we're left with what's called a white dwarf, small but hot star, and a planetary nebula around it. And the last fusion occurs until all of the hydrogen runs out. All that hydrogen will run out and it will give out no more light and we can call that then a black dwarf. But you have to remember that the universe isn't old enough to have actually seen any of these. So that is the life cycle of a star with mass similar to that of our sun. And often they will ask you about a sun-like star or a star with mass similar to our sun. Our sun is not a particularly remarkable star, it's about average in terms of its size and its mass. And remember that questions will usually ask you for just a specific part of that life cycle. So you don't often have to reel off the entire life cycle, each stage in each process, but really they're gonna ask you about, tell me what happens to turn a main sequence star into a white dwarf. So you need to go through the red giant phase and then eventually the white dwarf phase. This diagram is a really good way to remember the life cycle of a star. I'm gonna put each stage in the life cycle of a star onto this diagram. So we start with this, this is a nebula. That is a cloud of gas and dust which contracts under the force of gravity and eventually you get temperature and pressures so hot that nuclear fusion can start. And when that starts, you get what's called a protostar. The energy from the fusion in the protostar causes more nuclear fusion and you end up with a star which has a balance of the radiation pressure outwards and the gravity force inwards. And we call that a main sequence star. Now there's two different options here depending on which type of mass you have. So on the left hand side of the screen there you have stars with mass similar to our sun. So we'll go down that route first. At the end of the main sequence of a star with similar mass to our sun, you're going to have it expand and cool down to be a red giant. So it changes colour because temperature and colour are linked. Redder stars are cooler and bluer stars are hotter. At the end of its red giant phase, then the layers will drift into space and you'll be left with what's known as a white dwarf. And that white dwarf could be surrounded by what's called a planetary nebula, a nebula that's unlikely to give birth to new stars, but will have large bodies of rock and gas in it, such as planets. And we would end up with something called a black dwarf. A black dwarf is something that we haven't seen before because the universe isn't quite old enough for this to have occurred yet. But that's the theory, that's what we expect to happen. All fusion would stop and it will give out no more light. Now, if a star has much more mass than our sun, then it will go down this other route here on the right and will expand and cool down, but it will expand to be a much larger size. And so we'll call it a red supergiant. That red supergiant can go supernova. And supernova is essentially a huge explosion where the outer layers collapse on the iron core and boom, explode. And that explosion will give it enough energy to actually fuse together the much larger elements than iron. So that is a really interesting idea about space, that anything heavier than iron was made in a star which went supernova around this region of space in the past. And then there are two options, again depending on mass, with the left hand side a neutron star being the less massive option for these supernova stars. That is an incredibly dense ball of neutrons. So imagine a nucleus, but it is about three miles wide, and it's just neutrons incredibly dense ball of just neutrons all the protons have kicked out and what's left over for the highest mass options after a supernova it can turn into a black hole and that is an actual picture of our own black hole that is the most massive option and that is an object so dense that not even light can escape it this is a really really interesting topic but i suggest that for your exams you just learn these key stages and the key process to turn one stage into the next stage all of these images, incidentally, are real photographs from Hubble Space Telescope, apart from the black hole image, which was taken by the Event Horizon Telescope just a few years ago. The life cycle of a star with much larger mass than our sun goes into a red supergiant after its main sequence. The star expands and cools, and all of the elements, again, up to iron, are made by nuclear fusion. In the supernova, the outer layers collapse in on the dense iron core, and that bounce effect, that effect of them bouncing off the core, creates the explosion. And because of that, there's excess energy to make elements which are more massive than iron. In that explosion, the elements are scattered throughout the universe. 
What can be left over is a neutron star, which is a very dense ball of neutrons, or a black hole, which is an object so dense that not even light can escape its gravity field. So this is a little bit of a link into your atomic structure unit, where we talk about radioactivity and you need to therefore know and be able to use in this section the idea that nuclear fusion is when lighter nuclei fuse to make larger nuclei. Remember that elements less massive than iron can be made in main sequence stars and red giant stars and that's because these reactions will actually give out energy. Whereas elements that are more massive than iron are made in supernovae because they require energy to be taken in to make those larger elements. Those fusion reactions to make the heaviest elements actually take in energy. So that can only happen during a supernova. So this is one way that they can make this rather simple kind of memory-based topic a little bit harder is they can link it with ideas about nuclear fusion from the atomic structure unit. That's how they make questions more difficult. They just add in extra detail. And it's especially difficult when that detail comes from more than one unit.